Turn with me, please, to Matthew 17. Matthew chapter 17. In our last passage in the book of Matthew, we saw the amazing true story of the transfiguration of Jesus, where three of Jesus' disciples saw his glory, his glory as God. It was a life-changing, mountaintop experience for Peter, James, and John. But as these three disciples came down the mountain with the Lord Jesus, they're confronted more with a down-in-the-valley type of experience. In fact, the other disciples who didn't go up with them on the mountain have been dealing with a difficult situation for a while, and they're not dealing with it very well. At the bottom of the mountain, there is a crowd of people, and there is a distraught parent with a child in desperate need. Matthew 17, verse 14. It says, when they reached the crowd, a man approached and knelt down before him. Lord, he said, have mercy on my son, because he has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. Jesus replied, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring him here to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And from that moment, the boy was healed. Then the disciples approached Jesus privately and said, why couldn't we drive it out? Because of your little faith, he told them. For truly, I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will tell this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. As they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus told them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. This is now the fourth time he's predicted his coming death. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised up. And they were deeply distressed. Now this account is not that long, but there's a lot going on. In fact, this story also appears in the Gospels of Mark and Luke, where we get even more details. Mark tells us that when Jesus and the three disciples come down from the mountain, there's actually some of the scribes there. These are some of the religious leaders kind of following Jesus around, making trouble, resisting him. So there's a dispute with these religious leaders, although we don't fully know the nature of the argument. But there's a crowd there and the disciples and the scribes. And then at the center of all of this, there's a man and his son. Luke tells us in his gospel that this was the man's only child. And yet, the situation this son is in has brought great grief and pain to this parent. The son is demon-possessed. He's tormented by a fallen angel, which this fallen angel is following Satan and is, is harming this child, has control of this child physically and spiritually. And there are specific ways that this demonic possession was manifested. Verse 15 says there's seizures. The boy suffers terribly. He's thrown into the fire or the water by the demon either to harm or even to try to kill him. Mark, again, gives us more detail in Mark 9, verses 17 and 18. Someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. So he's also mute. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. Notice what the beginning of verse 17, if you don't mind going back just one uh, slide to verse 17, what it says, this parent has done, teacher, I brought my son to you. On Mother's Day, this is a wonderful reminder. Parenting is hard. Our kids encounter trials and suffering and dangers that are out of our control. So here's our big idea from this entire text. Bring your kids to Jesus. You can trust Jesus with them. Bring them to Him. Parenting, I think, is the hardest thing that I've ever done. 
Obviously, I'm still very much in the middle of it. (laughs) I'm not able to do it on my own. If you've got kids, neither can you. And we can't control everything. We have to bring them to Jesus. I love that simple statement. Sometimes we might think we, or act like we, think we know better than Jesus. Or that it's a good thing that God has us around to manage things. We might forget to bring them to Jesus. It reminds me of this story that I read about something that happened where I grew up. I'm from the Space Coast in Florida. It's the east coast uh, of Florida, Brevard County, where they launched the, they had the Apollo program, space shuttle program. They still launch SpaceX rockets there quite often now. But this story, I, I was on a, I'm on a Facebook group for people that grew up in that area. And there was a man who shared a story that happened back then during the Mercury program, which was leading up to the Apollo program. This is in the early 60s. John McAllenen was a well-known local reporter. He reported for a local newspaper called Florida Today. And at one point, he was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. But as you'll see, John McAllenen also had a great sense of humor. So this contributor to the Facebook group writes this. He said, who could ever forget Florida Today's John McAllenen On the morning of a Project Mercury launch, dressing as an astronaut and hitchhiking on State Road 520, telling people he was the astronaut due to be launched and had overslept. (laughs) Can you picture it? You got a helmet on, (laughs) walking down the road. One person gave him a ride to the Cape Canaveral South Gate, thinking he was saving the launch for God and country. Look, can you picture that moment? Now, obviously, I appreciate the generosity and the commitment of the person who gave John a ride. But did he honestly think that NASA would have an astronaut sleeping somewhere away from the launch site, depending on his own alarm clock going off, and not having transportation to the rocket? I don't think NASA was in need of those sorts of things being covered by everyday citizens with good hearts picking up hitchhikers. (laughs) And as much as we as parents bear a great responsibility in how we raise our kids, God is not in need of us in his ultimate care for our children. Now, we are responsible, but he's, he's the one who's sovereign. He's the one who we should trust. We're not more trustworthy or more wise more dependable, or more in control than the Lord. Sometimes it's easy to forget this. We can rely on our own ability or our own knowledge as parents. We can try to protect our children from every danger and end up stifling their growth. Or we might think, what if God calls them to go do something hard or dangerous or go overseas on the mission field away from me, or serve in an environment that's known for violence. I have to stop that. Jesus can be trusted with the lives of your kids. Jesus is worthy of their complete faith and complete obedience. This is the only life worth living. This is what we're training them for. Even if one of us goes overseas and and dies on the mission field. Our our staff read a story about that this week. God is still faithful. The reward for that person in heaven is great. And the way that person was raised by their mother and father to do such a thing honors the Lord. And thus fulfills the purpose of both our creation and our salvation, which is to glorify Him. That's why we're here. So in this story, this father comes to Jesus with a son in great need. It's his only child. Now, I didn't plan this out with my preaching calendar, but this text is a great one to walk through on Mother's Day. And if you're wondering about the mother in this text... I know she's not featured, but just know that it's highly unlikely that this was a single father. None of the three Gospels that feature this story say that 
the boy's mother had passed away. And men with children in this day and age did not often stay single for long if, if that had happened. So if I was a betting man, I'd wager that there was a mother for this boy back home holding everything down, working hard to manage the home so that this trip can even be taken. So that the boy can come and meet Jesus, so that he can be brought to Jesus. And I would also wager that she is fervently praying for the boy. And even if my educated guess about the boy's mother is not historically true, the principles involved for parenting and bringing our children to Jesus still hold true as we see what happens in the story. Watch what happens, verse 14, when they reached the crowd, a man approached and knelt down before him. Notice the posture there. It's a posture of submission, of entreaty, of homage, of worship, of faith. And notice the very first word he says to Jesus in this account. Verse 15, Lord. He calls him Lord. So right away, there's an attitude of trust, of reaching out and asking Jesus, of having faith for his child. Faith in the Lord for his child. I think you could even see this as a prayer. Lord, have mercy on my son. So he says, teacher, I've brought my son to you. And at the, he's praying. He's asking God to intervene. So letter A, under bringing our, our children to Jesus, pray for them. Have you knelt before the Lord, praying fervently for your children? Often, kneel down, see this posture, bow before Jesus, call him Lord in submission and honor and worship and trust and place your children in his loving, capable arms. Many of us have burdens or concerns about our children, whether they're newborns like we just saw dedicated today or elementary age or teenagers or adults, maybe even with kids of their own. This man had a nightmarish burden that I can't even imagine. And he physically brings his son. He walks his son to the Lord. But I would argue that when we pray for our kids, we are bringing them to the Lord in, in a way that's no, it's not below this. It's not inferior to this. We're bringing him to the Lord in the same way. In prayer. Well, second, just trying to flesh this out, we bring them to church. Bring them to corporate worship. Another way we bring our children to Jesus, especially while our kids are in the house and have to follow our rules, is simply to regularly have them in Sunday worship and in some type of small group setting, being taught His Word, seeing what life in the family of God is like, learning a passion for God and His truth and His mission. Bring them to the Lord by bringing them to church. Obviously, you're here today, so you're showing that that's important to you. But, but make it a priority every week. Make that your default, that if you're in town and you're not sick, you'll be here each Sunday. You'll teach your kids through that. You'll bring them to the Lord through that. Let her see, teach them to serve in church. And let your kids see you serving in church. I think of Alpine Village as a great example of this, where whole families come and serve together. Or kids camp. Um, Jackson, our son, Miss Dottie's got him trained on Wednesday nights. <laughs> he comes in, he goes to wash his hands, and gets in line, starts serving bread, or whatever it is she's got for him to do. I love that. And I didn't, I didn't tell him to do it. I'm not taking any credit. Um, but I love that he comes and feels welcomed to do that, to stand alongside other people who are serving in the body of Christ. That's a form of discipleship. That's good for our kids. If you had a mother that did these things for you, that brought you to the Lord, make sure to thank her. And if she's already with the Lord, you can thank the Lord for her still. And if you don't have children, this message applies to you as well. All of us are called to make disciples. Paul wasn't married. Paul didn't have biological children, but what did he call Timothy? Multiple times. His son in the faith. 
And you know what he told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.12? He said, don't let anyone look down on your youth, but be an example to the believers. In life, and love, and speech, and conduct, and faith, and purity. Whoever it is that you're trying to disciple or point toward Jesus or help grow in their faith, like this parent in this story, bring them to Jesus. Bring them to Him in faithful and fervent prayer. Bring them with you to church. And if they're willing, serve alongside them in His kingdom. We grow so much together as we do these things. Now the father in this story expressed faith in the Lord by bringing his child, by responding to his son's need with trust in Jesus. But the disciples were struggling with this. We see that there's already been kind of a even an argument going on with the scribes and, and the disciples trying to cast out a demon and failing. I think we learn a lot about faith and po- spiritual power through this passage. This is interesting that the disciples are struggling because way back in Matthew chapter 10, we saw Jesus say something about their ability to cast out demons. We, that was, chapter 10 was this long set of instructions before Jesus sent them out all across Israel to spread his mission. So watch what he said, chapter chapter 10, verse 1. Summoning his 12 disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to heal every disease and sickness. It's a pretty broad statement. They've been doing this. They went on this journey all throughout the land and then came back and reported to Jesus. They've been given the power by Jesus to perform this miracle. God's power is enough. But Jesus says their faith is too small. You can see his frustration in verse 17. This is not sinful frustration, but he's clearly frustrated. You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And he explains the problem in verse 20 when they ask him privately, hey, what was going on, Jesus? Why couldn't we cast out the demon? He says, because of your little faith. For truly I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will tell this mountain, a mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Again, Mark gives us a little more detail, Mark 9, 28 and 29. After he had gone into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And he told them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer. Some of your Bibles may add the words and fasting there. Some Greek ancient Greek manuscripts add that word. I don't think we have to quibble or worry too much about which ancient manuscripts are correct in this case. Prayer and fasting consistently go hand in hand in Scripture. It's interesting what Jesus says here, isn't it? This kind. It seems like this is maybe a more powerful demon than they have dealt with before. Clearly in the Bible there are hierarchies within the angelic and demonic world. You know, you've heard of Michael, the archangel. Arch, this is like the Greek prefix for first or highest. That's, I think, clearly the case in the demonic world as well. And so this one is more powerful, and Jesus says it only comes out by prayer or by prayer and fasting. It required more prayer to cast out. And the way that I read and understand this, I don't think Jesus just means prayer in the moment of the encounter with evil. Like, oh, I face this demon, I better pray extra hard right now. I don't think that's what he means. You don't see Jesus stop the conversation with the Father and say, hold on, I'm going to need some extra time to pray. Or guys, let's go pray right now. I don't think that's what he means. I think he means that faith and spiritual power come as a result of our ongoing preparation of prayer. Even before we get to that moment of trial or temptation. We know that Jesus often stepped away to go pray, to spend time with his father. Think about how Jesus prepared for his own temptation in the wilderness. It wasn't that the devil showed up to tempt him and then Jesus said, time out, let me go pray and fast. He had been praying and fasting for 40 days to prepare for that. And if Jesus needed it, you know we need it. I think prayer empowers and builds faith on a regular basis. So let's say that I'm trying to reach 
a goal to lift weights in the Olympics. I know that you all think that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> to have the required strength to lift that kind of weight. Can I roll up in the Olympics, you know, have a good time walking through the opening ceremony, enjoy the Olympic Village, hanging out with all the athletes, and then the morning of the competition, down a couple of energy drinks and go out and face the challenge of the day? No. There is a long, committed process of preparation of building up the strength necessary for that kind of challenge. I would have to do a ton of lifting weights, of experiencing pain and difficulty, of breaking those muscles down and building them back up, of going to the gym and growing in ability. It seems to me that there's an analogy there for what happens to us spiritually when we have an ongoing life of prayer, fasting, Bible study, church attendance, giving, sharing the gospel, what we call spiritual disciplines. We aren't prepared for huge struggles like the ones the disciples faced here by trying to gear up in the moment of the struggle. It requires a life of ongoing prayer, fasting, and other disciplines. And by the way, just to be clear, that's not so that we're building up our own strength. We don't have spiritual strength for this. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. What we mean as we're exercising those disciplines is that we're strong in Him. We're stronger in faith in the Lord Jesus. And strong in a way that your kids and others around you will see and be encouraged to imitate. Now Jesus in the passage talked about the mustard seed. Anytime He talks about it, I feel like I should show you one. And it's hard to even do that. I've showed you mustard seeds before in the context of Jesus' teaching about faith in this same book. Here he indicates that God will do amazing miracles. God can move a mountain with just the faith of a mustard seed. So he's literally saying that the disciples have less faith than this. And that's in spite of the miracles that they've already seen Jesus do and that they have done themselves by his power. Uh, I think that's a reminder of <laughs> the spiritual struggles that we will always face. The struggle between truth and lies. The internal struggle inside us. E even in spite of victories in the past, the internal struggle we'll still have between the flesh and the Holy Spirit. There will always be a battle for your heart and mind. Believe God's truth. Believe in Jesus' power. You can be trusted with your kids, with every struggle. I want to finish this message by showing you three quick and wonderful things about Jesus that we see in this passage that should bolster that faith in Him. That should help us to bring our children to Him and trust Him with their lives. Number one, Jesus is patient. He's patient in this passage. It's hard sometimes to be patient. As mothers, sometimes you all have to demonstrate more than a little patience, right? I saw a great example of that this week. I was reading a, a post online by a gentleman who said, I was digging through old boxes, or my wife was digging through old boxes, and she found her wedding purse. It was a little clutch purse, you know, she used on the day of her wedding. He said, she let the kids play with it since they like pretending they're princesses and such, and they've been carrying it around excitedly like it's a great treasure. It turns out they've been using it to store pepperoni. I mean, it's, it's the right size for that. Right? That seems like an appropriate use for a purse from your wedding. I know that Christy has saved the day countless times with snacks in her purse, both for the kids and for their dad. You ever carry pepperoni in there, honey? I think we should think about that. So that mom needed some patience. Patience is so important for parents. It's important for all of us. But it can be so hard. Jesus here is the perfect example of patience. Watch how he demonstrates it in this account. Verse 15. Lord, the father says, have mercy on my son. Have a care. 
Take time for my need. Be compassionate for my child and for my grieving, for what he's going through. And Jesus responds. Verse 17, where Jesus expresses this frustration, you unbelieving and perverse generation, he's being very open and honest, but he still heals the boy. He doesn't cast off the disciples. You guys, uh, that's enough. I need a new 12, right? (laughs) He doesn't do that. And then Mark gives us, as I said, Mark gives us more detail on this. And I love this passage, Mark 9, 21 through 25. How long has this been happening to him? Jesus asked his father. From childhood, he said. And many times it has thrown him into fire or water to destroy him. But look at this. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, everything is possible for the one who believes. Right there, Jesus could have said, oh, oh, you're not sure I can do this? Never mind. It's not what he says. He encourages his faith. Everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the father of the boy cried out. Look at this honest statement. I do believe, help my unbelief. It's almost contradictory. He's struggling. It may be faith about this size. One of those. And again, Jesus doesn't say, no, it says when, a, when Jesus saw that a crowd was quickly gathering, so other people get to see him and place faith in him, hopefully, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Where the father says, help my unbelief, this is one of those places where it can be helpful to ask of scripture, what if this had gone differently? This man just admitted that he's struggling, still having doubts, still not completely sure that he believes that Jesus can do this. He said, if you can do anything to the Lord, Jesus could have perhaps said, wait, you have unbelief? You're not sure I can do this? Never mind. No healing for your son. I might have done that if I was listening to the man, but not Jesus. Jesus is patient. Jesus sees the man's struggle of faith and he has compassion and mercy and patience for the parent and the child and his disciples. Jesus demonstrates his patience to all of them and to the crowd. He's not only patient, number two, he's powerful. You see that right here. Verse 18, Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and from that moment the boy was healed. I love the way Matthew phrases that. From that moment, immediately. The disciples were struggling. There was a delay. It wouldn't happen. Jesus says it. Boom. The boy's healed. All of his ailments as a result of this demonic possession are gone. He's whole. He's made well in his right mind. He's rescued. God can rescue anyone. I believe God does this stuff today. And by the way, your salvation is a far greater miracle than what's in this story. Because think about what it took for Jesus to what Jesus had to do to, to, to provide your salvation. Think about how far he went. Any soul turning from death to life, from hell to heaven, from an enemy of God to his child, that's a greater miracle than this. And God, I think, does lots of miracles today. I read an amazing and pretty crazy story from a pastor friend of mine who looked it up and, and wrote it up. His name is Griffin Gulledge. He wrote this. This is a crazy story, but I researched it, and it's true. By the way, I even went to Snopes.com, and they said this story is true. They're a very secular source. Between 1920 and 1950, Martha Paul was the stern choir director at West End Baptist Church in Beatrice, Nebraska. She was a stern choir director, Garrett. She demanded punctuality in her choir members. They all had to be at church at 7.25 p.m. for practice. This is a late start time for practice, but... In the past, they had arrived on time with very few exceptions. However, on the night of March 1st, 1950, they all were delayed for various reasons as they ready to leave for practice. Have you heard this story, Garrett? You're going to like this one. Marilyn Ruth Klempel, the pastor's daughter, spilled food on her dress and her mother needed to iron a new one. Herbert Kipp was trying to get a letter in the mail on time. Again, late at night. He planned to be a few minutes late, deciding that he could drop it off on the way to practice. 
Lucille Jones was too busy listening to a radio program and was late along with Dorothy Wood, whom she was supposed to pick up. Rowena Estes and her sister Sadie were late because their car wouldn't start. Joyce Black, who lived across the street from the church, was ready but too tired to get up. LaDonna Vandergrift was having trouble with a geometry problem. Who can relate to LaDonna? Mrs. Leonard Schuster would have ordinarily arrived at 720 with her daughter Susan, but on this particular evening she had to go to her mother's house to help her get ready for a missionary meeting. Because his wife was away, Harvey All was taking care of his two sons. He was going to take them to practice with him, but somehow he got wound up talking. When he looked at his watch, he saw that he was already late. Marilyn Paul, the pianist, had planned to arrive half an hour early. However, she fell asleep after dinner, and when her mother awakened her at 7.15, she only had time to tidy up and start out. Martha Paul, the choir director, and Marilyn's mother was simply late because Marilyn was. She had tried unsuccessfully to awaken her earlier. At 4.30 p.m., Walter Klempel, the pastor, turned on the heat to warm the church and departed. Instead, it filled with gas and exploded at 7.27 p.m., two minutes after practice was supposed to begin. However, since none of the members had arrived, not a single one was harmed in the explosion in what was deemed an incredible coincidence, I don't think so, or an extreme miracle. So maybe it's okay to be late to choir practice sometimes. <laughs> now if you think if you think that all those occurrences are coincidental, I think there's a problem with how you look at the world. The probability of every single choir member, including the very punctual choir director, all being late on the same night, and that evening just so happening to be the night when the whole church would blow up right at the beginning of practice time, it has to be about mathematically impossible. I think the Lord very clearly showed his power at work to rescue his people in that story. Jesus is powerful. He has power over demons, over all illnesses. He has power over temptation. Have faith in him. Look to him when you're suffering or grieving or struggling. Bring your children to him. He can be trusted with them. The last point about Jesus comes from the prediction he makes at the end of the passage. Verse 22. As they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus told them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised up. And they were deeply distressed. Number three, Jesus is our propitiation. I don't often alliterate sermons, but I had patient and powerful, so I had to pick a word about salvation that started with a P. Propitiation means the satisfaction of God's wrath. We deserve God's wrath for sin. That's what we've earned, Scripture teaches. And yet God in His grace and love and mercy chose to bear that wrath Himself. He became the appeasement of His own wrath in Jesus. Jesus willingly chose to do that for you and me. The death of Jesus, the Son of God, is enough to atone for all of our sins. He is our propitiation. He satisfies God's wrath on your behalf when you trust in Him. And coming back to our big idea of bringing our kids to Jesus, we should all constantly be pointing our kids and every person in the younger generation, whether you have kids or not, to the Lord as their only hope of forgiveness as their only hope of God's righteous anger being satisfied. Don't teach your kids that by being a good person, a good boy or a good girl, they can make it to heaven. If they could do that, Jesus didn't need to come. Teach them that the only perfect righteous, that, excuse me, that only the perfect righteousness of Jesus and his sacrificial death for us and his resurrection from the dead, only these things can save us from sin and take us to heaven. Don't teach your kids or the younger generations that God only loves us if we're good. Teach them that in His grace, God loves sinners so much that He sent His one and only Son to die for them. And whosoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but have eternal life. Bring your kids to Jesus. Trust Him with them. Let's keep bringing one another to Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this passage and the hope that it brings. That even in the most difficult and desperate of situations, 
you are faithful, you're powerful, you're patient, and you've provided us a way to be right with you. Jesus has satisfied the wrath of God. He went to the cross as he predicted in this passage. And he bore our sin and our sufferings and our griefs and our sorrows. And yet he didn't stay dead. He is alive today. And he has the keys to death and Hades. He's the living one. Father, I pray that you would help every person in this room who's a parent or grandparent to faithfully point their kids to Jesus in word and deed. God, I pray for those in this room who may not be parents, that you'll use them like you used Paul in Timothy's life. That you'll give them joy as they serve in your church and point others to you. God, I pray your blessing over mothers in our congregation or those who are watching online. Thank you for using them to point us to Jesus. We honor them. We honor you for your goodness in our lives through them. I pray that you bless our church as we go today and be glorified in all that we do and say, use us to reach our community with the hope of the gospel, pointing to the power and love of our Savior. We worship you now in Jesus' name, amen.